Hello, today is Friday, 13th. November 13, 2020. My name is Daniela Medina and I'm interviewing Monica Estes for the University Library Special Collections and Archives at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, hereafter abbreviated as UTRGV. This project is in partnership with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Ms. Estes, that this interview will be placed in the University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV and shared with the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. The University Library Special Collections and Archives will archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documents you are willing to share. UTRGV University Library will retain copyright to non-exclusive right to the interview and any other materials you donate to special collections and archives at UTRGV. Because we're not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting to make sure you agree with our interview procedures before we continue. So I'll ask you a series of six questions please say yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each question. <laughs> Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, question number one, do you give university library special collections and archives at UTRGV consent to archive your interview and your materials at the UTRGV university library? Yes. Okay. Do you grant UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives right, title, and interest in copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes. Okay. Do you agree to allow UTRGV University Library and Special Collections and Archives to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes. Do you want, do you grant the University Library Special Collections and Archives consent to share your Zoom interview with the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voices of a Pandemic Oral History mini project, which will include yes. posting oh. the interview on the internet. That's okay. That's okay. It's okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, as you recall, recall, we previously filled out a pre-interview form. We use information for the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure Voices server at the University of Texas at Austin. That's when I asked you like about your, your mom, your dad, and all those questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, okay, before Voices sends it to UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members. So that will not be part of your public file. So the information on your mom and like your dad and stuff like that, like it's not gonna be public information. Your public file will only be accessible at UTRGV University Library. The final two questions will ask for your consent on what I just described. Question one, do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives? Yes. On occasion, UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and Voices receive requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone number or your email with journalists? No. No? Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you, for your thank you for your consent. Your experience and stories mean a lot at the UTRGV Special Collections and Archives, and I look forward to what you have to say in the interview questions I will ask now. <laughs> nice. Okay, so um, I just wanna say thank you, honestly, for making time today, because I know <laughs> you're very busy and I know you have a lot going on. So, <laughs> Uh, the UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and the Voices Project, thank you for sharing your stories and your experiences with us. You know, as someone, you know, whose personal, professional, and academic life has been affected by COVID-19, I 
I'm really confident that your story is extremely valuable to our project and that it will bring a lot, a new insight to what is going on currently with the pandemic. So once again, thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. So just so to give a little background on you and get to know you a little bit more, who is Monica Estes? Like what, just a little brief, like a little history about you. Well, I am from Houston. I was born in Houston. I lived for Corpus for a little while and I moved to the Valley. I had lived most of my life in the Valley. Um, I decided to go to college at Texas A&M Corpus Christi in 2018. And I've been taking college class since I was in high school. So I moved over here and I've been going to college and I'm a full-time nursing student. Just got into the yep. program. Congratulations. And I, thank you. And I work full-time at a nursing home as a care attendant CNA. Um, that's about it. I mean, <laughs> I really don't have anything interesting to say besides that I work full-time and I go to school full-time. Well, I'm a double a major with a minor. Yeah, look. Look at that. That's very impressive. Yeah. Don't don't undersell yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the following questions are just your personal understanding of COVID-19 and your first encounters with it. So the first question would be, when did you first hear about COVID-19 and how did you learn about it? Did you learn about it through the radio, TV, social media? The first time I ever heard about COVID was back in December of 2019, whenever it was arising in China. I usually go through Daily Mail on my Snapchat. And that's whenever I started seeing cases of COVID and videos of, you know, people getting sick and nobody understanding. And that was the first time I've ever heard of COVID. Okay. Okay. And what was your first reaction to the information about COVID-19? I was, I, I don't know if I would say scared, but it was crazy to see how, you know, like videos of people just dropping on the streets and nobody understanding what was going on. It was like all these, I don't know if you would call it conspiracies of where it was coming from or where it came from and who bought it and all this stuff and who made it up. It, it was just like a crazy thing happening. And it's like, what is going on over there in China? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um okay so at what point did you realize that this pandemic was you know something serious like a, li a life altering event or do you or maybe you don't think it's serious why if you don't you know I think I finally took it serious whenever they shut down my work not like it was like lockdown since I live in since I live since I work at, at a assisted living nursing home they shut it down because cases were starting to come up in Corpus and it was like rising in the U.S. and that's whenever it clicked in my head that it was becoming serious and that it was coming here to the U.S. Yes. And do I still think it's serious? Yes, I do still think it's serious, but yeah. At first, did you think it was like the Ebola, how it happened over there, but it didn't really reach the U.S. that much? Was it something similar or? I thought it was going to be like the Ebola. I thought that, you know, like people were obviously people were going to be dying and stuff, but I thought that there would be a cure to it or a solution to it by now. Okay. Okay. So um, over the last few months, what news media, social media, or other sources do you rely on to keep, to keep you informed about the coronavirus? The newspaper, literally the newspaper. <laughs> I, I go th at work. Obviously, we have some grandparents that get the newspaper. So sometimes whenever they don't want it, they give it to me. And I just go through whatever's on the newspaper. I don't really check on it anymore on my phone or, you know, like, what's happening? It's just like, oh. Or, you know, sometimes some news pops up, you know, or like what comes out of the news whenever, like, I'm doing something in a residence room. Like, I'll watch the news with them. And, like, Fox News is always on. CNN is always on. So they're obviously always talking about the corona virus so that's whenever I get to hear about it so I want to say the news and newspaper okay so can you share with me what you understand about COVID-19 as an infectious disease 
Likewise, if you can, can you share with me what you don't understand about this new coronavirus? I just think that, I mean, I understand it. I understand that it's like a disease that's literally swiping the whole nation, but it's like, it's so hard for me to understand how like they still haven't found a cure for yes. it. Or it's like, I understand that it's hard to find a cure, especially so quick, but it's also like, how come the president got to get cured how come you know like yes. some people are getting better quicker and others are not yeah so I don't know I just feel like I had just have a general understanding of COVID just as everybody else has nothing more nothing less you know so you might know. say that you question like the healthcare system and how it helps others most or like depending on like their social class their economic status something like that I would yeah, I would say so. Yeah. I would say so, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so regarding regarding that, would you take the first COVID-19 vaccine available on the market? Why or why not? I would. You would? Because Yeah, because it has to be approved before putting it out there. So if it's approved to put it out there, then I'll take it. I mean, it's being proven right now that it's 90% effective. So if it says that it's 90% effective, then I would take it if I could. Okay, I would take it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do your family, because I know they, they were affected by this, um, do your family hold the same beliefs as you about COVID-19 or are there some members who take it more seriously or more lightly? How is that for you? My mom who got COVID takes it very seriously. She had COVID for about a month and a half and she's fine now, but she takes it very, very seriously. Like masks, wear masks everywhere, hand sanitize everywhere, always wash your hands, you know, don't stay close to people. She's traumatized of catching it again. I, I, I can imagine. It, I, it just sounds like I I read the news too, and I'm like, no, this is just I would rather yeah. stay home. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, we're gonna move a little forward with to discuss your family because as as you mentioned, they did get um, they did contract the the virus. So any questions about your family that you don't wish to answer, that's completely fine. Okay, so you can just say no, I don't feel comfortable at answering this, and we'll move on to the next question. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so when, so you meant, I know that your mother, she's a hairstylist. She runs her own like hair salon. Yes. And she contracted uh, COVID-19 through one of her clients. And then unfortunately yes. she brought it home. Um, how did you feel when you found out that your family uh, tested positive for COVID-19? What was your initial reaction to that? I knew it was happening. See, I knew it was happening, but my mom was such at denial that it was happening that it was me pushing her to make it make sure she believed she had it because for her, it was just a cold. It was just a flu or something. I'm like, no, you have it. So it was, I don't think I had a reaction. My reaction was just like, you have it and you cannot deny that you have it. Same thing goes for my little sister and the other person that lives in the household. It was like, you guys have it. Like, you know, like it was just me pushing it into their heads to believe they had it so they discussed this like they told you them feeling this way and you were pushing them like okay well it wouldn't hurt to test it out right exactly because like I said they just thought they had a cold or like a little flu or you know just something so out there and I'm like no you have COVID okay so and there is such a denial that they had it okay so so your mom's beliefs changed after she. Yes. Okay. Um, so you're saying that, you know, that you were pushing them to get tested and stuff. Were you satisfied with the response of the Hidalgo County? Like on behalf of your family, you know, I'm talking, do you feel as though they were taken good care of? Did they have easy access to COVID-19 tests, their results, um, medication afterwards, treatment? Um, in my opinion, no. Um, I remember whenever my mom and, and, um, whenever my mom went to go get to get tested 
she got up at two in the morning to be at the testing center at three and she was there all morning all the way till maybe three o'clock in the afternoon waiting to get tested in line and same thing she was in the car no bathrooms they didn't have lunch breakfast nothing so it was brutal and imagine having all those symptoms you know everything which was like the vomiting the diarrhea the nausea just everything and being in a car for that long is just so exhausting so do I think they did a good job no and then afterwards whenever they took my little sister to go get tested it's the same exact thing but even what happened with hers is that they lost her results so they never gave her the results, whether she was positive or not, but we knew she was positive because she had all the symptoms. And obviously because my mom and that other person in the household was sick. So there was no denying that she did or did not have it, but she never received the results. And when they called to ask, Hey, what's the results? They had no clue. So they couldn't even find anything to prove it either. Like, like if it never happened, I guess you would say. And okay. even they stated themselves, even they stated themselves that they had had issues reporting COVID cases and that they had issues with losing files and stuff. So, so the yeah. Hidalgo County wasn't prepared at all for this pandemic? No. Oh, that's, that's so <laughs> horrible to imagine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Um, uh, And you mentioned that they were sick. It took um, an entire month to fully recover. A month Uh, and a half. Oh, a month and a half. Okay, sorry. Um, Mm -hmm. What was your communication with them like um, throughout their recovery period? Were you able to, you know, contact them often or was it whenever they had, you know, spurts of energy? It was purely through phone and text. And if they needed, like, we would send, um, we would order groceries for her. Oh, okay. like weekly so we would um, order groceries and they would deliver it to the house you know just there on the porch but it was mostly just talk to her through the phone or text but most of the time she didn't want to talk at all mm. you know she just did not want to have any contact with anybody yes yeah okay so so she was very you know cautious about not getting in touch with anyone and try to limit the amount of people she came in contact with in order to prevent the spread Well, she did not go out whatsoever, but whenever I meant, like, even talking on the phone, it was too draining for her to even talk on the phone with us. Like, she, like, she just did not want to do anything. Yeah. Okay. Wow. (laughs) I've never, I'm just hearing this now. This is, um, okay, so, so obviously, you know, your mom, she was sick, and then she recovered, your whole family recovered. Um, What was that like to be able to, or... After they recovered, how long was it that you, before you went and visited them in the Valley? A month. I waited a month. So after even after a month and a half? Yes. After that month and a half, I waited a month to go visit them too. And even at that, they still had sight. They still, to this day, still have side effects of COVID. You know, my, my mother has trouble breathing she can't catch her breath her blood pressure is high now and it's like and my little sister too she gets fever on and off for no reason and it's like prolonged effects I guess you would call it I don't know okay and do you feel like this is this has something to do with uh the like the access that they have to healthcare, maybe or I don't know I just they have access to healthcare, but it's just like it's something that like they feel that they're gonna have to live with this from now on. You know what I mean? Okay. So you don't really think it's like maybe uh, something that the doctors may have done wrong or the reasons because because you know obviously like for instance the president he got um, COVID and he recovered, but. Um, there doesn't seem to be like any prolonged effects like the, the same way your mom has them. Well, they, the thing is that my mom and my little sister never visited the doctor. They never visit. Ever since they got COVID, they have never visited the doctor. The only way that they were treating everything was with over-the-counter medications. And my grandma, who's a nurse as well, she was, get, she was sending them over-the-counter medications and what to take and everything, what to make them feel better. So everything was off the counter, homemade remedies, 
you know, okay. stuff like that. So they never visit the doctor or anything. So maybe if they went to the doctor and got it checked out, maybe there would be a solution to it. But for them, it's like, oh, I got to live with this now. Like these are just side effects of what happened. You know what I mean? And do you think that maybe their, like, their lack of doctor visits or they, they're they simply not wanting to go to the doctor, do you think it might be something like a cultural thing? Because, you know, before, you know, my mom too, she tried to give me, um, as a Mexican mom, she tried to give me, you know, teas to prevent COVID and my grandma too, some like, you know, little teas here and yeah. there, mix honey to prevent the getting COVID. Do you think it has something to do with that? I think it does because obviously if you're not sick, then why are you going to go visit the doctor? Mm -hmm. You know, obviously it's like for them, it's like, oh, you like, I, like I said, for them, it's like, oh, it's, it happens, you know, like I had it. So this is what I have to deal with now. And I think it is a cultural thing for them not to go visit the doctor to go check this out because it's so minimal to them. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> for answering that. Um, so, okay, so you say you waited a month to visit your family. And did you notice, you know, because obviously you had to, it was like, it's like a, what, a three hour drive, I believe, from Corpus mm -hmm. to the Valley. And in case if you made any stops or anything, did you notice um, any difference or similarities in, in the regulations implemented by the Hidalgo County that you didn't see in, in the Nueces County in Corpus or was it basically the same, you know, were people good about wearing their mask and staying social distancing? Oh man, this was so long ago. This was in the summer, so it's hard to remember back then what was going on. But I think we were like in a lockdown. I'm not sure, but I remember that before though, that it wasn't really required to wear a mask. Like Okay. everybody was wearing an option or even to go to the store like there wasn't like you need to wear a mask it was okay. like oh it would be preferred if you weren't a mask okay so it wasn't but I think that was yeah it wasn't like a mandatory thing or same thing the lockdown thing where it was like you cannot go out it's like now everybody's out and going I don't know back I can't, it's hard to remember oh, it's okay it's what okay. happened it's literally been going on for so long yes I ended we're at the end of the year already and still going on mm. um and so going back to your mom to your mom and her job she is self-employed correct she mm -hmm. runs her own hair salon um mm -hmm. how did contracting the uh, COVID-19 affect your family's financial stance you know did your mom file for unemployment or any sort of financial assistance provided by the Hidalgo County no, she had the option to do it, but she relied on her savings account to do it. But if she didn't have her savings account and didn't have backup money, then it would have been an issue because obviously she has bills to pay and the place where she's at, she's also renting, you know, and obviously the bills never stop. And thank goodness the, the person who's renting her at the salon he was very nice enough to tell her, you don't need to pay rent this okay. month or, you know, you don't need to pay rent for the next two months. And he was very gracious. I don't know to her to say, you know what, you don't got to pay anything, you know, just worry about your, just worry about yourself. Yes. So thank goodness they didn't. Yes. It was, it was hard for them because they would have to, you know, take everything out of their savings account. It's, you know, it's a lot, it's not a little bit of money, you know, bills are bills. So she could have qualified, but she just didn't want to do it. Okay. And do you think, again, this is going back like a cultural thing, like maybe, oh, you want to be able to be, you know, provide for yourself and not ask for help or something like that? I don't think it was a cultural thing. I think it was just that my mom didn't want to go through the process of applying okay. or of, you know, having to wait for I don't know months weeks whatever the case could be she didn't want to wait and she didn't feel the need of going through that trouble okay you know she just felt like you know what this is easier to just take it on my savings account than have to go do all these other things and not only that she isn't very techie smart so it was like no thank you to her 
And do you think maybe her experience with, you know, getting access to COVID tests may have impacted this as well? You know, this idea that, well, maybe it's not worth, you know, the weight and the, and all the paperwork. Yeah, she definitely feels that way about it. Now she's like, oh, it's not worth it. You know, like, I, if I, I know, I know, you know, like, she's like, she, I, she already knows. There's no point of doing all this paperwork. There's no point of going to go get tested. You know, she's like, if, like, I'll know. Yeah, okay. Well, that's very sad to hear, you know, that <laughs> a person can't rely on, on their government. Um, okay, so after, obviously, after she was better, uh, your mother, she returned, she returned to work. Um, she did, right? She's working now. She's up and running. Yes, finally. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and she's, as a hairstylist, you know, she has to, even if she practiced social distance with her other clients, she has to get close, you know, to get, to do her job. Um, are you worried about her safety? now that she's returned to work? Well, in her, what what she does for a living, it's very hard. It's impossible. There is no way that, that you could do the six feet apart. There is no way because she has to be touching them. You know, she has to touch their hair. She has to touch their hand, their feet, you know, their face, everything. There is no way that she cannot avoid it like, because this is contact to contact there is no way that she could avoid it she's taking her precautions she's taking temps you know she's making sure people sanitize people wear masks but even at that you know how people are today you know just pulling it down or yes. oh I'll be fine let me take this mask I can't breathe or you know what I want wax or whatever you know it's very hard so do I worry that she'll get sick again yes I worry especially because she's had it before and not only that my little sister obviously goes my little sister, she goes to work with her every day. So I also worry about my little sister getting it too. You know, it's hard to avoid it at her workplace. Yes. Unfortunately, some people have jobs like people like you, you know, that they, <laughs> they're exposed to every, to very close contact with other people. Mm -hmm. Um, so, oh, I lost my question. Sorry. Okay, so speaking about your your young your sister, she's 10, 11? You said she it was she's turning time. eleven tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. Yeah. Um, so uh in regards to your sister, what was your biggest concern? Do you feel as though her reaction to COVID nineteen was made more difficult due to her young age or the complete opposite? I mean, she was fine. She felt like she didn't have it. She had it. I mean, she had the fever. She had the chills. She had the nausea. She had everything. But she literally was fine. She was just a kid, you know? She was yeah. still doing everything a kid does. And me, it was like, okay, how is she doing? Is she fine? You know, does she need anything? You know, like I kept checking up on her, see if she's gotten worse, if she's gotten better, how she's doing. You know, every time I would call them, it was like, okay, how's Amy? How's my little sister? How's she doing? So if, for me, I was a little bit scared, but it was also nice to see how my little sister was like, oh, it's COVID. <laughs> Nothing's happening. <laughs> and so you for, feel, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. What? So, so it was like, it was nice to know that she was like, oh, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. So, yeah. Okay, so you think her her younger age is what made it easier for her? You think maybe I think she didn't have like a full grasp on like the severity of it? Yes, that, and I also believe because she is very hot natured. You know, she's always having sweaty hands and sweaty feet and everything. She's so hot natured that she couldn't feel the fever. She was so hot natured that she couldn't feel that she was sick. So it was like for her, it was just an irregular day. You know what I mean? Yes. But yeah, for her, I feel like she couldn't really understand what was going on she knew she had it but it was like oh it's okay <laughs> well that's, that's good to hear that's good to hear yeah. um and how you know obviously because you didn't contract the virus and you were three hours away from your family members and you know you were you were you're you know by yourself in corpus you know uh so how was how has that changed your view of COVID-19, you know, having experienced it from 
like far away but still very close to you since it affected your family mm -hmm. well I was always being so precautious you know like sanitize whenever I put gas sanitize if I go out to the store sanitize my steering wheel sanitize like I was sanitizing everything and wearing mask and everything and I know it shouldn't be this way but now that it's like prolonged it's I'm not taking it as serious as I'm supposed to. Yes, I'm still wearing my mask. Yes, I sanitize once in a while, I guess you would say. But now it's like, oh my goodness, I just want this to be over with, you know? Like, I know the seriousness of it, and I understand that I still got to be careful, but it's just whatever now, I guess you would say. It's like normal, I guess. It's like the new normal. Okay, so you've, you've become ac accustomed to it. It's like, okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. it's like it's never going to leave okay um so now i'm going to ask you some questions about your work so uh as you mentioned you're a care assistant at a nursing home uh what are your everyday responsibilities what does a day in your job look like and how has it changed due to COVID 19. well now with COVID, everything's changed nothing is the same anymore you know, even from the moment we walk in the door, we got to mask up, put goggles, take our temp, do a questionnaire. And then um, same thing, we got to serve everybody in their rooms. We have to feed them in their rooms. Whenever we go clean in their rooms, we have to, you know, be careful where we clean. And now they're allowing them to go out with their family. They're allowing them to go on vacation. They're allowing them to visit. They're allowing, you know, people from the outside to come in or, you know, they're coming to the hospital so now we're having to quarantine them and it's hard to like quarantine them and then having to give them their food and all this stuff and then not only that we're getting we get tested every week for covid so that's another thing that we also have to do more is get tested every week and it's like a lot more work a lot more work than before so you so now um, the residents there, they have to stay in their rooms or are they allowed, you know, because I know before they used to have, as you mentioned, you know, they used to have dinner together, breakfast, lunch, dinner together, and they could be in the common area. So now do they spend more time in their rooms? Is that what you're saying? A lot. Yes. A lot of them spend more time in their room, more than ever. A lot of, yeah, they don't go out. Some of them don't go out at all anymore. They could still come out and visit in the common area. They could still come and, you know, they'll have exercise, but same thing. It's six feet apart. You can't be together. You got to wear your mask and everything, but it's nobody wants to come out anymore. It's like they've gotten used to staying in their rooms by themselves. Oh, that sounds, yeah. oh my God, that sounds horrible. Um, so, and do you think um, this has affected their mental health? You know, absolutely. There is no denying that it has not affected them. I, out of everybody, we have 32 residents. I kid you not, only two are all there. Like from how they were before till now, it's amazing. Like, like I said, they've become more lazy. They don't, all they want to do is lay in bed. They just want to sleep. They're depressed. They're sad. A lot of them can't even remember anything anymore. Like their mind is literally going, they're, they're losing they're losing their memory they're losing everything you know and it's like literally they're declining physically mentally in every single everything okay like it's so hard to explain to even because you literally get to see them decline in front of your own eyes because of this because they can't go out they can't socialize they can't see their family members they're not stimulating their brains they're not you know they're just laying in bed they're not reading they're not they're not doing anything to stimulate their brain so they're literally just declining in bed and they're not even realizing it so and do i think it has a, if covid has affected them i absolutely think so and um so obviously you know you're there to take care of them is there anything that you're allowed to do to you know um i guess help them with their mental health because, you know, obviously you're mentioning that it's affecting their conditions as well, you know, not just their, uh, their moods and stuff, but is there anything that you're allowed to do? I mean, we try to get them out of the room. We try to, you know, hey, let's go do exercise or let's go do this, you know, or like, hey, let help me put your clothes away because obviously we do housekeeping for them and their laundry. So we try to get them 
moving or, you know, we'll try to do activities with them. Like, let's go with this. But their attention span is so little that it's like you could start doing something with them. And by the next five seconds, they're not interested anymore. They don't want to do it anymore. They just, oh, I'm tired. I want to go back to bed. You know, it's, it's hard to keep their attention. Very hard. If they're like little kids. You can't keep their attention for long. So it's hard to, to get them out whenever they just want to, oh, no, I just want to stay in bed. So it's hard. And um, has this made me, because oh, you mentioned that, you know, before they weren't allowed to visit their families and stuff. And now that they're allowed to, um, has, do you think that maybe that, um, I guess that since now they're, that interaction with their families has allowed them to, you know, maybe recuperate a little bit, you know, or is it still the same? I don't. I think it's the same because even when families, families now have to schedule visits. So if they want to go see their family members, they have to visit. But then at that, they have to visit outside. They cannot come inside the building. And a lot of the times the, the grandparents or the residents are like, no, I don't want to see them. I'm sick. Or, you know, like they'll make an excuse not to go see them. Like, like I said, they do not want to get out of bed. So they'll say no, another day, another day. So now it's, family isn't even important to them anymore it's now I just want to stay in bed like they're just there's no way like I said yeah it's like they don't care for their families anymore it's like so minimal to them it's crazy yeah it is it's so yeah I had no like I because I just had no idea this is so this is so this is so crazy Yeah, they have no interest whatsoever in anything anymore. Um, okay, so um, so currently, you know, at this, by the CDC, you know, it's recommended for people to stay home as much as possible. And um, that is not an, that's not something you can do. You know, your job requires you to, you can't work from home. You have to leave your house. Um, How does, does that worry you or do you feel safe leaving your house every day and then, you know, having to come home? Um, I really don't go out, literally. <laughs> I li usually it's just from school to the house, from work to the house. So it's, do I worry? I worry mostly at school of getting something at school at work. We're, you know, we're being super careful and stuff about who could come in. And most of the people that are coming in the building are health, um, home health workers, hospice workers, you know, therapists and stuff. So them, same thing, questionnaire, everything masked up, everything. So I don't really worry about them. What I worry about is school. I really don't know how they're taking care of it at school. And it doesn't seem like it's a very good job in my opinion. So am I scared? I am scared, but only at school when it comes to school. Okay, so, you know, maybe like grocery shopping and stuff like that, that's not a problem for you, something you feel safe in those environments as well? I feel safe at grocery stores, I guess, because I get to see them, you know, sanitize the carts and stuff. So it's like, oh, I feel good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, And when the pandemic first started, um, how did your job handle the constant changes in safety precautions? Because as you mentioned before, you know, it wasn't uh, mandatory to wear a mask and now it is. So how has that changed in the nursing in the nursing home environment, you know, from when this started to now? Whenever it first started. It makes me upset. Whenever it first started, you know, we did everything right. We completely shut down. Nobody could come in or out. You could only go to the hospital. Even doctor's appointments were hard. They couldn't even go to the doctor's appointment, even though they needed it, you know, but if, and if they had to go to the hospital, it had to be because they had to go. So literally it was a lockdown, lockdown, same thing. Nobody could come out of their rooms. Nobody could go out to the common area, nothing at all. And That was because there was barely any cases. This was back in March. There was barely any cases in Corpus. And even at that, in this small town. And now there's a spike in Corpus. There is so many cases in Corpus. There are so many cases in Rockport. There is so many cases. And it is 
upsetting to see how now it's like, yeah, you could come in. The family members, yeah, you could visit with them. And obviously family members aren't going to always listen. They want to sit next to them. They want to touch them. You know, they want to kiss them. And it's, it's like, it's like now it's worse, but we're being so lenient now. It's like, oh, it's fine. You could go out with your family for the weekend and you could stay in your room for two weeks. But yeah, we still have to be in there. You know, it's very, it's very like, like I said, it's like, it feels like it's going, it's a new normal, but it feels like it's going back to the way it was before all of this had ever happened, even though now it's worse. So you think people are getting too comfortable with living? People in are getting life. comfortable. Mm -hmm. wow. But I feel the same way too. I feel like I'm getting comfortable with it now too. So I don't blame them, but it is kind of upsetting to see them be that way especially because they're old yes and they are at higher risk of getting the COVID, the virus um mm -hmm. um so you already so you mentioned that and then you also mentioned that the residents you said they were they have to spend more time in their rooms now um hold on because you answered and <laughs> you answered most <laughs> of the questions without me even needing to ask them <laughs> Oh, uh, have any of the residents um, contracted the virus? And if just in case there is maybe a case, what are what is protocol for you guys? Thank goodness. Ever since we've been closed down in March, we have not had one case. So hooray to us, because for me, that's us doing a good job at keeping it out. Um, Honestly, we really don't know what to do if it were to happen. We don't have enough staff. We're always short staffed. We don't have enough people hired. So if it were to happen, we honestly don't know what we would do because we're so short staffed. So what we think is going to happen is that they're going to be sent to a facility where they do have the staff and they do have the rooms to take care of them because also we don't have I guess you would say a hall to lock them in or to keep them in, you know, I guess you would say like a little corner. We don't have a corner to keep them in because our facility is not that big. So it's like, we can't do that kind of stuff. So it's like, if it were to happen, they would have to go to a, a different facility. Okay. So do you also feel like maybe this, um, cause this isn't like, a. do you guys receive, um, help from the government like funding from the government no it's all private pay oh okay so there's no way you can like maybe or is there any way that you guys can ask for any more or well obviously not because it's private pay you can't ask for more money so but do you feel like or do you do you feel like you're like how do i word this like your management could be better with this understaffing or um I, honestly, I don't think it's management at our facility. I think it's corporation. Corporation would can barely want to move a foot to do anything. Budget-wise, everything, everything-wise, it's like corporates dragging their feet to do anything for these residents. And it's, it's you know, it's not on my boss's hands to do anything. Like, she can't do anything. She's literally, you know, has her hands tied behind her back because corporate's not letting her do anything or corporate's not you know increasing the budget because of these things and the pay is really really awful so nobody wants to work during nobody wants to work because the pay is awful and it's so much work that we're doing now and there was never a raise there was never a bonus or anything so it's like who wants to work this kind of stuff were so you affected like, oh sorry go on no continue <laughs> were no. you affected um financially you know because of the pandemic, did you suffer, you know, a cut in, in your paycheck or were people let go? No, nobody was let go. Nothing. We tried keeping as many people as we could. And I mean, I wouldn't say I was affected financially because I was working. I was working even though, you know, but it's the same. It's always been the same. So did I have difficulties with my bills and stuff? No, it's always been the same for me because I was able to work. Even whenever there was a lockdown, I was able to work. And was there an increase in my pay? No. Did I receive a bonus for anything? No. Even though, you know, the facility that's right next to us and we're sister facilities, we're owned by the same corporation. 
the facility next door to us got a bonus and got a raise and we got nothing. So it's kind of upsetting to see how these people are getting raises and are getting bonuses and us that it's literally just us, us two girls for 32 residents do everything. And whenever next door, they have nurses, they have CNAs, they have keratins, they have janitors, they have cooks, they have, you know, people who feeders, you know, it's like they have so much staff, but us that it's only two girls for 32 residents and to do everything. It's kind of upsetting to see that kind of stuff. Okay. So, so say, uh, okay. So you're saying that you do everything. So you do, you cook, and then you also do laundry, you do. I don't cook, but I do serve them the food. I plate their food. You know, I have to serve them their drinks. I have to do their laundry. I have to deep clean. I have to strip their bed. I have to clean their toilets, vacuum their rooms, you know, shower them. I have to give them their medicines, you know. I have to make sure the whole facility is clean, you know, and sometimes we'll go above and beyond for them, you know, like clip the dog's hair, you know clip their hair, clip their nails, you know, just we're doing above and beyond for these residents. Literally everything that you could imagine that a person needs, even if it's from, even if it's you standing up to get up from the toilet, we have to do that. Changing everything. It's like, we have to do everything for them. Oops. Ooh. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and do you feel then perhaps it's a lack of empathy, you would say on like corporate's behalf? Do you think it's more like, um, you know, as you say that they're dragging their feet? Ooh, did it freeze? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, so do you think it's a, a lack of empathy? You know, their reaction to how they refuse to, you know, give you the funds that you need or in the staff that you need? I just think they don't care. I just feel like they honestly do not care because... We're, like I said, we're a small facility. Next door facility has 600 residents, 600 people in one room. That's their money-making business. Us, it's only 32. How much money can we be making them? So it's like, oh, you know, we don't really care about that place over there. Let them figure it out. Even though it's like impossible. So it's more oh, yeah. of a profit kind of thing for them. Yeah, it's more of a profit kind of thing for them. And if it's, you know, requesting, hey, we need this. It's like, oh, well, too bad. Gotta kind of have to deal with it without it, you know? Um, so you've, would you say that that's the hardest part currently of your job, having to handle all 32 residents between you and the other girl that other girl. works with you? Yeah, I feel, I feel like that's the hardest thing. I mean, we've always had to handle them. But like I said before, they were better off on their own. You know, they used to do a lot of things for themselves. And now it's like, you got to do way more for them. You have to, you know, do a lot more things for them. And, you know, all these COVID things that we have to be doing, it's like, there is so much more things we have to do. So it's more draining, I guess you would say. So it's like your, your job has doubled. Doubled. Yeah. It feels like I have, it's, it's definitely have doubled. No denying that. Wow, that's. I'm really sorry to hear that. I truly am, because I, because I, I really do know how much you care about the residents and how passionate you are about this. So I'm, I'm truly sorry that you have to go through this, especially right now. Yeah. Um. So I'm gonna switch to your school. Um, to questions about your school now, because you mentioned that you also you have to leave your house for school so your school's not doing online completely at all no it's not online completely some classes are online some classes are in person but the classes are that are in person are packed i mean packed and how many face-to-face -face courses are you taking currently i am taking five courses right now and i have two face-to-face -face. okay so two of them are face-to-face -face. um so you mentioned that it it concerns you going to school. Um, does it bother you that you know that you're not giving that up? Because I know most universities have moved on. Like UTRGV right now is currently fully online. Does that does it upset you that your school doesn't your university doesn't take that step to secure their you know their students' health by going fully online or? 
I, yes, it's concerning because like I said, they're still counting attendance as a grade. So it's like, what if I can't go? What's going to happen? And even if we, if we do online, it's like, she's like, like the professor, like you got to be in class. It's like, well, I'm in a classroom with 300 plus students. I don't want to be in that class. You know, it's like kind of, it is kind of upsetting to see that, you know, we don't get an option. You know, it's just whatever classes we can put online and whatever classes that have to be online. So there, there isn't really an option for us. I don't know how they, how they're doing it to choose what goes online and what stays in person. Do you think maybe it has to do with uh, your, um, uh with your major, your career, you know, cause, cause you know, um, not necessarily. I don't think so. No, because some of my nursing classes are online and some of my nursing classes are in person and some of the nursing classes, like, for example, the nursing class that I'm taking, it's like I said, it's a lot of students and this professor teaches, teaches this class, teaches several sections of this class and three sections are online and two sections are in person. So it's like, it could have been online, but she decided to keep it in person. I guess it's her option. And um, do you think that this, maybe this pandemic with some of your professors, if not all, um, do you think it's made them more understanding and supportive of their students? Or do you feel as though the communication with your professor in concerns of, you know, as you mentioned, all this, uh, face-to-face -face, uh, has remained the same as before? I think that it, it's kind of re remained the same as before because like I said, they're still counting attendance of the grade. Who's doing that during a pandemic? And it's not like, you're not sick, so you got to come to class because I'm taking your grade. If you're sick, then okay, stay home. But it's like, they're not giving us that option. And even at that, it's like, you're kind of scared because you don't know if these seats are getting sanitized, if these desks are getting sanitized. Sanitize. so it's like you don't want to go because of those reasons mm. wow that's oh, that's so horrible mm. here um so um do you feel like talking about you know the school sanitizing the seats and stuff um do you feel safe with the so you don't feel safe with the precautions that the school that the university has set for students in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19 no no, I don't feel that because I'm just seeing this in, my, in the classroom. And I don't know if these things are getting sanitized, but even whenever I go to the library or I go to the, to the gym, if I go to the, you know, to the UC center, which is like, I don't know, the dining, dining, I never see anybody clean up. I never see anybody wipe down anything. You know, it's like, you have to do it yourself, which is obvious, which is okay to, you know, take your precautions, clean down the seats or whatever. But it's like, I wish I felt safe to know that they were doing it you know so on behalf of or see students, or like see somebody students. walking around you know cleaning yes. you know see you know okay. see actually see somebody there so it's more like you feel like the school has the university has no initiative to take care of their students mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what about the students are the students good about you know wearing masks social distancing no it feels like the same as before, like it's never happened. So it's the same environment as, you know, people are too comfortable with this pandemic? Yeah. Okay, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I did some research on your school and they have a, a website where they inform students of any active on, on campus active cases for COVID-19. Um, and recently, so far this past week, um, there have been, I'm not sure if you're aware, uh, 26 active cases with direct <laughs> on-campus impact. Were, were you aware of those? No. No? They stated that they would be sending us emails of who's active at school, but so far I have not received any emails whatsoever except for the beginning of the school year when there was only like three cases. But mm -hmm. I had no clue that there is that many cases at my school. Um, and so does that scare you? Do you feel like maybe you like the students should, or is this something that the Dean of the university should definitely, you know, come into it into his attention? I think it, I, I strongly do believe that it's the Dean's job purpose to be telling the students 
that there is these many active cases because like I said, we're not give, we're not given the option to stay at home. It's like, okay, let's hope you don't get sick, but hey, there's 26 cases, but you guys don't know about it. You know, it's like, it's kind of scary. So I really do believe that the Dean should be doing something about informing the students what's going on in school. Like we shouldn't have to be go searching for it. Okay, cause so you do feel like the university has to do a better job of sending or giving these resources to their students. Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, okay. So obviously you, we've talked about your, your anxieties and your concerns regarding, you know, your health in the school, but what about your concerns with your, with your studies? Um, do you feel like COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has hindered your abilities to study or your abilities to learn and process information better? Yes, I feel like I have a way more difficult time studying, not just studying, even learning like these online classes. It's like I need somebody to be pushing me and putting the information in my ear. I can't get myself to sit down and read my book or, you know, I don't even get lecture videos. So it's like I got to go through the PowerPoint on my own. It's like it's even hard to get myself to do that. Now it just feels like, okay, I got to do homework. I got to finish the assignment on time. You know, it's like I'm not learning. I'm not learning anymore. I'm just finishing assignments now. So it's kind of, it does feel awful because it's like, I'm not learning anymore. I'm just doing homework. And, and on top of that, it feels like I'm doing 10 times the homework than actually learning or anything. So do I believe that my learning has been hindered because of this? I do believe that because I feel like I'm a better, I'm better at learning in person and having hands on practice whatever you want to say and not only that it's also become difficult to get in contact with professors it seems like it's impossible to get in contact with my professors now and even if I do it's very like they don't want to answer you it's like oh here we go again oh okay well wow that's that's so <laughs> mind-blowing to hear yeah um so so you've mentioned, you know, that professors are not really putting an effort to trying to help students and that everything, basically you're teaching yourself mm -hmm, these classes. Mm -hmm. um, and you also mentioned that you got accepted into the nursing program. Um, does that worry you, you know, because you mentioned that you don't feel like you're learning and that you're just, you know, it's kind of like a robotic process, process where you get the information, you submit it and then on to the next one. Does that concern mm -hmm. you for your for your nursing program? It does concern me, but what makes me a little bit relieved, even though I am complaining about it, is that it's it's going to be in person. Some of the classes are going to be in person, so it's it's a relief knowing that I'm going to be in person and learning these things for, and I'm actually going to be hands on. So it's mm -hmm. it's a relief to know that that's going to happen to me, especially because I'm going to be in a field that it's like I. So I have to know all this information. Like there is no, you know, going around or anything. It's like, I have to know this. And do you, even then, since, you know, you've mentioned that your classes are still very crowded, do you feel as though maybe the quality of the, of your education, you know, maybe they're trying, maybe they might try to, you know, just um, fit, you know, something into like a timeline so that you guys are not in such close, contact especially since it's uh I've seen the auditoriums and they're all you know very close there's no it's just one door to come in and one door to go out um does that concern you maybe that they might try to limit the amount of time that you guys have to learn everything I think that it would stay the same I don't think anything would change really I mean yeah I don't think anything can really change okay and um are you aware of how the spring semester is going to be for you? If they're still by that time, still going to have face to face or they might change it to complete remote learning. It's going to be face to face and remote learning. However, we will not be getting spring break anymore. Oh, so it's going to be you're still going to the weeks for spring break. You're still going to get classes. Yeah, there's no we have no spring break like that's non existent in the spring anymore. So 
are you happy about that? Because you know, spring break is a is a time where you know college students, especially or younger people, you know, they go out and they have fun and they party a lot and they're in very close contact. Does this relieve you that you might not have to go through that? No, I mean, I believe we're we're supposed to have a break. I mean, I mean, it's a long semester. It's draining to go through all these classes and spring break was the time to literally have a break and take a breather for a week before going back to running, running, running. I mean, obviously students are still going to go out. Students are still going to have their spring break. So nothing really changes. In my opinion, nothing really changes. Students are still going to go out. You know, students are still going out. They're going to bars. They're going to clubs. They're going, you know, having, you know, whatever, you know, they're still continuing their regular life. So in my opinion, taking away spring break for us wasn't really anything. It's just hurting us because we don't have a break in the semester anymore. You know, in the spring, our break, it's spring break. And in the fall, our break is Thanksgiving. So now it's like, we don't get a break anymore. It's like, so you think this is just so this is have um has there been any like a uh, sort of like red like a uh, discourse about this between students like students maybe trying to reach the dean or trying to figure how to um you know how to because obviously as you said it's gonna it's already school's already stressful and then you have you know in your mind you're like oh i have this break ahead of me and then for it to just be completely gone, just has there been anything of that conversation of that those topics of that sort with on campus, like with the student body? Not that I know of, not getting it. I mean, obviously we've discussed it between students and stuff, but I haven't heard anybody, I haven't heard anybody, you know, actually go like to somebody of authority and, you know, discuss it wow that's 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 horrible to hear because i haven't heard anything in my <laughs> school that they might take spring break away so let's hope not <laughs> but wow this is just wow this is just very a lot to process i'm so sorry that you have to go through this truly you know and wow um Okay, I'm trying to get it together. This is just wow. <laughs> um, okay, um, and these are just some um, uh, final questions. Basically, uh, we're gonna move on to the final questions discussing like a certain, I guess you're satisfaction with the way the government is currently handling the situation. Um, are you satisfied with the local response to COVID-19 in Nueces County? No, not at all. Honestly, I feel like it's an awful job. I mean, not just Mrs. County, but just whole United States. It's an awful job of what they're doing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so even by the governor of Texas, um, you feel like the state response to COVID was just wasn't good either? Or do you feel like maybe they had a better response to it? I think they had a good response to it whenever everything was closed down literally everything the only access you had was the grocery store I think that was a good response but then I also thought it was very stupid of them to decide oh let's open back and you know seeing all these spikes and everywhere you know just the cases rising up again it's like they're not closing anymore instead they're like you know what let's open 75 percent capacity let's open you know let's open bars let's open this it's like it's getting worse and you want to open more things it's like you shouldn't. Okay. You're trying to stop it. Yeah. Yes, that is that is the goal. Um okay, now at a national response uh for to COVID nineteen led by President Trump and his administration. Are you satisfied with the job that they've done? No. Mm -mm. I, no. <laughs> oh no. Sorry. Okay. Um Okay, so now if you had the power, you know, if you were giving the power to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, what would you do differently? I mean, I would think for my, if I had the power, I'd probably keep all of this locked down still and, and then keep everything closed and students, you know, do remote learning, but also don't 
I mean, don't pressure us any more than we have to. And I would, if I could, I would have better testing, testing things, you know, where everybody could have access to getting tested and not take so long and make sure everybody gets the results right. You know, like just, I would just want everybody to get better. So in my opinion, a lockdown would do it because you're not with other people. I mean, you're with your household, but your household is your household. You're not spreading it to other people. You're not, you know? So I think for me, if I had the power, I would probably go into a lockdown again. So you'd be a lot more stricter with quarantine and everything. And yes. Like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so this is a special year. Obviously we've already passed it in our national democracy because it was a pres- presidential voting year. Did you, did you vote? Yes. You did. Um, and so at, did you vote like through mail or did you go to an actual voting site? I went to a voting site. Okay. Um, and did you notice or do, a, is this your first year voting or? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So in regards to the, like any precautions for COVID-19, did you notice anything in particular that stood out to you? No. Nothing really. It's just like, oh, you just go in. There's nothing really. Okay, but precautionary or anything. Okay, but like, was everyone, you know, like six feet apart? People had to wear their masks. Oh, yes. Sanitizer provided. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, Just wanted to make my question a little more specific. Um, So, yeah, this concludes our interview Um, (laughs) is there anything else you would like to share with me about your experience with COVID-19 that maybe I didn't get to touch on or I didn't ask of you I think you've touched everything you did good (laughs) thank you (laughs) thank you oh thank you so much well thank honest once again thank you for your time I know that you're very cute and I know it's a it's a very difficult time right now you know, with work and school. And honestly, I do think like your, your, that your experience will be very much appreciated by your project. So, and it's, I just, I'm so blown away with everything that you shared. <laughs> I just thank you so much for taking the time you. today to share this honestly, truly. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Well then, Have a good night. (laughs) Good night.